I'm here with a few members of the Faculty of Applied Science who are going to share with you their amazing research and just some of the ways that engineers are making an impact in the world. This research is very often interdisciplinary, meaning people from different engineering disciplines or different faculties like science and medicine all work together. Hopefully these very short introductions to just some of the research happening in our faculty will give you better insight into the variety of topics a degree in engineering may allow you to explore. Engineering research and the application of this research is truly changing our world for the better. So with that, I'll invite our first research spotlight to the stage. And at the end of all of our research spotlight presentations, you'll be able to use the Q&A in the stage to ask some questions. You can start asking those questions now and we'll take the most popular questions. You can give a little thumbs up to other folks' questions and we'll start with those questions with the time that we have left. All right, first off, I'll bring Naoko on. If you'd like to share your screen, we can get that going. Great. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Erin. My name is Naoko Ellis and I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering at UBC. And uh, I wanted to start uh, from my happy place, and this is uh, in Ontario, where I grew up, I partially grew up. Um, and this is where be I became concerned with the environment and climate change. Um, I did well in science and math during high school, and I actually chose chemistry, uh, science as a first degree. But as I, I went through the program, I realized that engineering was where I needed to be in that it was closer, much closer to the impact in society. And so graduate work was all in chemical engineering. And uh, here I am as a professor uh, working uh, at UBC. Um, what I work on is energy systems. And I would like to share how an interesting and exciting period we are actually entering into. Um, I particularly work on clean energy uh, systems. So you might think, well, why clean energy? And it is because we're in an energy transition. We realize that the consequences of certain non-renewable energy sources that are having on the planet, we're looking for renewable and clean energy sources um, in, this, in this field. Well, what would that look like? Well, we really have an opportunity to shift to clean energy sources. And as engineering uh, professor, uh, I work with a bunch of uh, students as well as uh, other collaborators in looking at technical advancement in clean energy sources. Also, we have an opportunity to kind of revisit our relationship to energy. And knowing that everybody here has an energy story, we do have relationships. And how do we actually start that conversation to think about shifting to cleaner energy and having that societal uh, shift occur? And that's another big challenge that I think engineers do really well in terms of um, having that technical background and, and the knowledge and language uh, to uh, converse with. And finally, I think it is an opportunity to think deeply about our relationships with others um, and to others in terms of human relationships as well as to non-human relationships on this planet. So what would that look like uh, in my lab? This is a photo of one of my reactors that I have at UBC. And this is a reactor, chemical reactor that goes up to maybe, can be heated up to 900 degrees C. Um, in this, uh, I do a lot of experiments in terms of capturing carbons, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide. And this is be and inside of that, you would see something like this where there are some particles or powders that are chemically bond um, bonding to CO2 in order to extract the CO2 from flu gases and other combustion uh, energy sources. With this, uh, what I'm able to do is to um, trap the CO2 on the surfaces and then to release it to concentrate so that I am able to take it away or use it for other um, conversion processes. 
I look at the surfaces and seeing how these powders are changing after a number of cycles of binding and releasing CO2. And this is a topic that I could talk forever, but uh, I'll stop there for now in terms of how it might look like. But what this research has really got me into is to really start a conversation about energy systems, as well as how carbon capture and storage is a tool that we would need to have in order to get to cert certain goals that we need to have in terms of greenhouse gas emission targets. Um, if you are to Google search my name and the conversation, you'll get access to this um, opinion piece that I wrote. This is really um, targeted towards us as in um, citizens and voters who are really uh, needing to understand where this kind of technology may reside and how and what kind of impact we may need to make in the society. Another um, project that I'm working on is really looking at um, energy transition in rural and indigenous communities, starting from BC. And uh, this is where we connect with and co-create some of the solutions in terms of shifting some of their diesel-based um, energy um, production system to a cleaner uh, choices. And this is um, sort of working on enhancing community well-being through energy sovereignty. And it is really kind of thinking around um, what does it mean in terms of truth and reconciliation in terms of energy sovereignty in this, in this country. So there is a lot that really quickly goes out in terms of the impact of what I do in my lab, as well as how that goes out in community and society. So finally, just some of the questions that guide me, and this changes all the time, but for now, I'm sort of really curious about how do we co create the conditions for sustainable futures? And I do that in conversation in class with students, as well as some of the uh, graduate students that I work with. How do we effectively deal with uncertainty and complexity in this world? And then how do we educate systems beings? And this is sort of like beyond systems thinking, but each of us realizing that we are a part of the system, every decision we, we make actually do uh, matter and affect the system itself. So these are some of the big questions that I've been working on. And with that, I'll stop here and look forward to um, the questions later on. Thank you. So I will be your next speaker for all of six minutes. I'm going to talk to you about additive manufacturing, but more specifically, cool stuff with additive manufacturing. My name's Adam. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering here at UBC and super happy to be so. I spend my time researching what I think is one of the most fantastic, exciting technologies in the world, but also getting to teach people about it as well. So I consider myself very lucky indeed. Uh, let's get going. So what a time to be alive. The image that you're looking at now is created with mid-journey uh, through the Discord interface. So many of you might be familiar with the use of artificial intelligence to generate images. And I prompted this algorithm to create me an image, which has never existed. It includes people and artifacts that have never existed, uh, simply by typing in the prompt, Professor 3D Printing. There's some clues that this is uh, uh, an artificial image because you can see that the mouse doesn't quite look right. And isn't it kind of weird how this professor is looking almost at an image of himself? Uh, but artificial image generation can also go awry. It's possible already to mix an instruction, Professor 3D printing, with a profile photo. So I inserted into image J my picture, and it kind of makes this really weird and freaky version of myself somehow embedded into this kind of image. But the reason why I, I start talking about images like this is because the technology is now coming for us to use natural language, natural language being the way we speak and talk about things to design. And that's one of the things that I've been working on with my with my students. So my students make use of simple 3D printing technology. They gather some information, some data. They process that data or they acquire that. 
and they create what we call a value proposition. Many of you might have one of these 3D printers at home in your bedroom and you might have bought it for less than 500 bucks. And the thing that you print might have five to ten dollars worth of value to it. But in actual fact, the information, the data that you generate and how you process it can make you very rich. In fact, one of my student groups last year had a get rich quick scheme uh, in which they were going to start a company printing 3D cap memorials. Uh, so I'm sorry if your cat has passed away very recently, but it would be possible to collect a photograph of your cat to turn that into some form uh, three dimensional geometry to maybe capture a paw print and then 3D print a memorial that will allow you to memorize or create a memorial, I should say, for your passed away moggy. So that's a good example of consumer uses of 3D printing, something that you might be familiar with at home. But I also spend a fair bit of my time doing industrial 3D printing. So taking a laser beam like we have on the left hand side here and firing it at a metal surface. So what you can see in the top left is an ultra slow motion video of a laser hitting a metal substrate. If we know how to do this, we can create these kind of things. 3D printed metal structures, which is something my team has developed some expertise in over the years. Now, you have to understand the math, the physics, the material science, some control engineering, some mechanical engineering. And you put all of those together and you make a manufacturing engineer or a, an additive manufacturing engineer like myself. What would we like to do with this technology? Well, one day we would like to build components that go in aircraft. So this is what we call a BLISC. If you've ever flown on a hopefully a Hawaiian 787, you'll have used Rolls-Royce jet engines, which are amongst the best in the world. And they help to propel your aircraft at the speeds which will take you to where you want to go very quickly. Problem is, it's very difficult. These things are very, very challenging. They have to be very safe. So the, the, the challenge that I face most often is building high quality things that can be used in these applications. In terms of my impact of society, well, the products of my research have gone on to form two spin out companies called TextureJet and Sintam, which live in the UK, where I was uh, formerly a researcher. And they're both managed by my former PhD students. By the way, the people that I create are the people that I'm most proud of. That's the deliverable that I offer when I impact society, creating clever people who make impact. At that point, I've used all my time, so I must hand over to the next speaker. Hope to speak to you later. Hello, everyone. Uh, just wondering if you guys can see my screen. Okay, I start. Uh, actually, I'm Ali. I'm Ali, uh, Director of Hydrogeo Science for Watershed Management Laboratory. Uh, I'm also Assistant Professor of Hydrology and Watershed Management uh, in the Geological Engineering Program at uh, UBC Vancouver. Uh, I hire co-op and grad students with background in civil engineering, applied mathematics, applied statistics, computer science, physics, earth science, and mining engineering. So a little bit about actually uh, the type of research that my actually uh, group do. Uh, so uh, generally uh, landscape, we know that the landscapes, watersheds, uh, filter the signals of rainfall and uh, generate uh, actually uh, stream flow. We can see that after rainfall, we have a uh, landscape and watershed that filter the rainfall signal and generate a stream flow or uh, river flow. However, uh, stream flows in uh, different uh, landscapes in uh, one, for example, landscape in BC, uh, like uh, compared to another landscape in Ontario, uh, stream flows in different landscapes are not equally sensitive to change in rainfall, to climate uh, change. So we can see uh, landscapes and uh, watersheds actually as a different spring. Some of them are very resistant and uh, actually against external change. 
Some of them are much less resistant against external change. So uh, landscapes are uh, similar to springs and they uh, respond uh, differently to uh, like uh, the same change, the same uh, perturbation. Uh, such actually change in uh, their behavior and their functionality or such differences in their uh, functionality of the landscape uh, will lead to a totally different uh, vulnerability of landscape to climate change and to changing uh, climatic uh, signals. So, uh, so uh, with the same uh, climate change uh, signal, with the same uh, climate change effect, some uh, landscape uh, might be uh, much more vulnerable to drought, uh, to flooding, to drought, to wildfire, and also to water quality uh, issues such as eutrophication of the lake uh, that uh, significantly reduce the quality of uh, water in the streams and in uh, lakes and uh, rivers. So this is uh, one uh, one type of question that my research group focus on. So uh, which uh, and uh, Majority of uh, our study sites are across North America in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we also have some site in uh, Central uh, Europe and Australia. So we've, uh, we are uh, actually uh, exploring uh, uh, which uh, type of these springs can be assigned to which uh, landscapes and uh, are we dealing with the landscapes which are extremely sensitive to climate change or those which are very, very resistant against climate change. And we don't see that much vulnerability if uh, like a significant climate change uh, uh, or changing climatic signal happen to them. But uh, what is uh, actually uh, more important, in my opinion, might be uh, watershed uh, management. And this is the second type of uh, research question that my research group focus on. The point is that uh, when we do watershed management, when we do mining activities, when we do uh, forestry activities, agricultural activities, we might change uh, the way uh, landscapes and watershed actually uh, filter uh, climate signals and uh, we may uh, unintentionally actually uh, move a uh, landscape to be extremely vulnerable to, to be extremely vulnerable to changing climatic signal or to be extremely vulnerable to any type of change in external uh, forces so this actually uh, might this effect might be much more important than uh, climate change change itself because it can significantly change the characteristic and behavior of the uh, landscape and more importantly uh, as we've seen before in, and also we've shown in some of uh, our recent work. So uh, the watershed management conducted in an unscientific way could make the landscape more vulnerable to climate change and the vulnerabilities to drought, flood uh, or uh, wildfire, eutrophication and water quality issues in surface water bodies may, may increase uh, due to unscientific uh, watershed uh, management. But what should we do? Actually, uh, we need more agriculture, agricultural activity. We need more uh, mining activity. We need more forestry activity with the population growth. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one uh, side that we have to uh, really care about. Uh, the society should care about. The society requires all these resources. Uh, to be actually uh, developed. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we know that uh, adding more forestry, agriculture or mining activity and in general adding more uh, management of the watershed may increase the vulnerability of landscape uh, to climate change, uh, vulnerability to uh, climate driven uh, disturbances such as wildfire, drought, flood, and water quality issues, water bodies. So we see actually landscape uh, across uh, this uh, equilibrium and uh, non-equilibrium condition. So uh, in my research group, we focus on uh, this type of question as well. So very exactly in each landscapes, we can do a land, uh, we can do watershed management, for example, we can do mining activity uh, in a way that we are not uh, actually uh, forcing the landscape to pass this threshold of sustainability. So if uh, actually, uh, and to keep actually landscapes below uh, this uh, threshold of sustainability that we can see, and if they pass that threshold, they're gonna be something uh, 
similar to this type of a spring and we have a hard problem because uh, returning them, restoring them to uh, equilibrium condition and to the sustainable condition uh, might be impossible. So this is a type of uh, actually question that my research group focus as well. So where in the landscape, where in a given landscape, we can do watershed management, we can engineer different uh, activities to ensure that we are not damaging our landscape, we are not increasing uh, the vulnerability of landscapes uh, to different climate-driven disturbances such as flood, drought, and eutrophication. You can learn more about my research group work on uh, our website, our research group website, and uh, I would be happy to take your question at the end, at the end of uh, the session. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Voder Ben. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Engineering at UBCO's, uh, at UBC's uh, Okanagan campus. Uh, today I'll talk a bit about my research on decision support systems with a particular focus on our work on sustainable industrial development. So uh, how do we think about uh, sustainable industrial development? Well, first of all, we can look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. One of the goals is linked to industrial development but we can't focus on that solely. We need to consider our environmental impact as well as our uh, societal impact as we develop um, and industrialize. So how do we help decision makers and stakeholders make better decisions related to uh, industrial development? Well, we use a variety of uh, computational and, and other tools. And one of the tools that forms a foundation for our research group's work is called the product space and the product space is essentially a network of relatedness of products it's computed on the back of uh, analyzing trade data so essentially every dot here uh, con represents a commodity that's traded globally so this big black dot is oil which is one of the most traded commodities globally another largely traded commodity globally is is obviously passenger vehicles and all of these blue dots um, represent various uh, types of machinery. So what do these links mean between them? Well, um, that refers to the um, co-export of, of products. So if products are co often co-exported, they're located close to one another and uh, linked together by strong links. And why is co-export so uh, important? Well, if we see that products are often co-exported, we can assume that they require similar capabilities to export. So, for example, apples and pears are often co-exported because they require similar um, climates, similar skills, similar infrastructure. But countries that produce apples don't necessarily produce clothing. So this is the clothing and textile industry. Um, but we see that countries that export shoes, export shorts, export shirts. But again, that doesn't help you produce cars. So again, why is this useful? Well, we can look at what are countries currently exporting, what are they currently producing, and what are the opportunities to move into new products that are close to their current production structure that they should be able to move into in the future. Um, and also, which of those products and capabilities will help them grow in directions that in, in, enable them to grow more in the future and diversify further? So what we unfortunately see is that developing countries are mostly stuck here in the periphery they're doing relatively simple uh, activities such as extracting oil, uh, farming, mining. Um, and these activities do not give them many opportunities for further diversification and industrialization. So our research group really focuses on how do we assess where these countries are at? How can they leverage the limited capabilities that they have to move into newer um, new opportunities that um, increasingly or help them increase the number of capabilities they have um, and enable them to break into some of these more complex activities in the future. <clears throat> Just as a quick example, we've done uh, a variety of, uh, we've analyzed a variety of industries for, for a variety of countries, but this is just an example of the uh, iron and steel industry in South Africa. So in general, uh, the steel industry or the value chain can be um, analyzed as, as seen on the screen. So on the top, on the left hand side, you'll have iron ore, which just its extraction is a very simple uh, activity and doesn't really support economic growth. But the more you process uh, the iron ore and the more complex the products become, the more these products also support economic growth. Um, although there are some uh, exceptions to the rule. 
Um, and if we look at the case of South Africa, in general, South Africa is very competitive upstream, uh, but it's not a country that is very strong in, in, in generally exporting products that are further processed. Again, with some uh, exceptions, such as mining related machinery or ships and related products, etc. Okay, but again, what does this um, help us? Well, given the capabilities that South Africa already has, the complexity of products and the country's goals in terms of environmental development, social development, we can plot optimal and calculate optimal developmental paths that leverage the country's existing capabilities while maximizing the benefits that the country might gain from developing certain industries. Um, and it's just one example of how we try and um, support decision making related to sustainable industrial development. And that's my six minutes, but um, hopefully I get some opportunity to engage with you further during the question and answer session. Sorry, Erin, you were muted. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to bring everyone back on the stage now. Um, and we have a few questions that were added through the q and I did see quite a few questions about admissions. Um, we're happy to get to those admissions questions tomorrow during our admissions presentation. Uh, but we did pull out a few great questions that were asked today. So one of them is kind of talking about students. I know that you all have research going on. Are there any opportunities that you work with students in your lab to do any of that sort of research? Yeah, Adam, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I think it will be true for all of, all of us who've presented today that we're we're super keen uh, to get uh, students to engage in our labs and execute the research objectives that we have. I, I'll let viewers into a, a secret that I don't actually get to play in my laboratory very often at all, really. I wish I did. It's all of my students who get the, the fun times to play with the, the machines and the design tools that we make available to them. So absolutely, uh, there are opportunities to, to work in the lab. And in fact, it's the kind of key activity that my students will engage in. I'd be interested to know what my colleagues think. Yeah, I guess I could follow up and echo what you said, um, Adam. Um, there are summer research positions that are available um, through co-op. There are some other opportunities as well. So there are many ways to engage in research at UBC. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, later on this evening, we will have a presentation about maximizing your university experience. There's some additional information in there of how to get involved in things like research. Uh, we have some great clubs as well where students can get involved in research on their own. So maybe not in an official lab, but doing their own research projects as well. Uh, this leads into maybe a little bit of what Adam said, but one of our other questions was how much do professors at UBC actually teach about their own research versus general engineering principles? So maybe if anyone wants to jump in to share what that looks like for you. Perhaps I can break the silence myself. So uh, it really depends uh, at which stage you're up to speaking about mechanical engineering. So uh, the way I would like in applied science studies is there's a toolbox that you get when you you start your your degree qualification and the toolbox is a little bit empty so you need to fill it up with some of the principles that you'll use later there's some math there might be some physics there might be in the case of my colleagues some fundamental biological or chemical principles that you need to acquire and they, those each constitute a tool that goes in your toolbox and after two, two years of study or perhaps three years of study, that toolbox is full and then needs to start being used in projects. But we'll also top that toolbox up with content from our research. <clears throat> so by the time you get to your fourth year and you take what we call technical electives, you're really polishing and getting to know what happened in my lab. Maybe not quite yesterday, uh, but certainly fairly recently. I'd be interested to know what colleagues thought about that as well. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I'm talking about third year and fourth year courses that uh, I'm teaching, and uh, uh, we are kind of updating uh, the uh, 
course content uh, every year uh, and we are uh, kind of adding uh, some sort of uh, some of our uh, recent research that's uh, relevant to the topic so in addition to that we have some uh, we have uh, the group in our department who are developing uh, computer application and dashboards uh, from uh, research findings, uh, research findings which uh, might be relevant uh, to different courses. And uh, uh, for the case of the course that I'm teaching in third year, last uh, year actually, we use some of these dashboards uh, in classrooms and uh, students actually uh, got familiar uh, with, uh, uh, were able to actually play with the dashboard and uh, see how uh, like uh, most up-to-date research uh, may work and uh, might be relevant to the theoretical concept that they learned in previous sessions of that lecture. Yeah. Great, thanks. You have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, there's one really interesting question. So uh, one says, I'm a high school student who's really interested in climate change research. What's the difference between addressing climate change as a general sciences student and as an engineer? So I know that question about kind of science versus engineering comes up a lot for us. Um, anyone that spoke about climate change or climate research today, any input on kind of what your job as an engineer is doing to change that versus maybe what someone in science might do? I guess I could get started because um, <laughs> uh, I have actually looked at it as well. Um, as a scientist, let's say if we are looking at climate change and adaptation, as a scientist, you might be looking at data and predicting what may happen in terms of the effects of climate change. And from an engineering perspective, we may be looking at what are the impacts to those who are, let's say, on coastal communities that are needing to adapt to these um, uh, changes that are being um, occurring? And so engineers would tend to look at um, the problem solving part to see what are some of the technologies and perhaps impacting uh, policies even and to see um, from the point of view of the impact of that climate change. And I'll pass it over to whoever would like to follow. Perhaps I could add to that. Um, so one of the things that I think engineers have to take responsibility for is through through the the industrial age, uh, which can which can trace its roots back to the UK um, in the industrial revolution. We've not actually been that responsible. We've not been the best citizens of planet Earth. And therefore, we do have to take responsibility now and consider our energy futures as a manufacturing engineer, which is one of the, the, the biggest offenders in global emissions. Any any percentage change we can make on our processes, any percentage improvement we can make does have a dramatic effect. But there's also this, this dichotomy between the sociological changing people's habits, changing how people live their lives, and also developing the technologies which will help us to move to a more sustainable future. I'm sure I speak for all of my colleagues when I say we don't have the answers, uh, but we're working on it. And we also need more people to work on it. So one of the things I'm absolutely stoked about is when I meet young people entering into engineering who are saying, A, this is important, and B, I want to do something about it. Can I pass over? Yeah. Uh, actually, I think it's a very good question. And uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned during my presentation, so uh, my research group produced uh, like a science required for engineering and management. So uh, for the, uh, this specific question, I think uh, with climate change science, at least in uh, like a, uh, my field of research, uh, we are trying to learn the way uh, climate change actually may uh, alter uh, existing and uh, natural functionality of the landscapes, natural and existing behavior of the landscape. So uh, if, for example, we consider one equation uh, that best represent the behavior of a system, which can be landscape for my case, so how climate change alters that equation? So this is the scientific part. And uh, as a, an engineer, uh, also, we are trying to uh, design and engineer uh, planning and scenarios to kind of uh, regulate uh, this change in the equation, regulate the change in uh, the behavior of the landscapes, and also in ensuring that 
we are not making making that worse, right? We are not uh, by uh, poor uh, design, by poor engineering design, we are not uh, making that uh, like a behavior uh, actually worse. So I, uh, these two can uh, are highly interrelated, in my opinion, the science and engineering part of uh, climate change. Uh, so one uh, teach us uh, what's what happened and what's going to happen, and one teach us how we can uh, regulate it, how we can uh, actually uh, resist against uh, what's going to happen by uh, uh, smart design, by smart engineering design of landscapes. Wonderful. Thank you all. I think those were some great answers. Um, I know we had lots of questions come in and I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them today. Uh, we are going to wrap up this session. I wanna say a huge thank you to all of our research spotlights who are here today. I learned lots, I hope that you did too. Uh, and we have lots of great information. This recording will be available for you to watch it if you missed any part of it. Uh, we'll have it available later tonight. But thank you again so much for watching and a huge thank you to all of our research spotlights for joining us this evening. We're gonna wrap up the stage right now. We'll be back on in just a couple of minutes to start the Y Engineering presentation. Thank you.